Hi, I'm Lisa. In this video, we will continue the series of listening to native speakers in Los Angeles talking about their jobs and their lives. I believe it's one of the best ways for you to reach that final level of fluency, learning the advanced vocabulary that native speakers use, and of course, learning the common everyday expressions that native speakers use all the time, but you don't necessarily learn these expressions in your English classes. You will listen to my conversation with a young woman named Kendra. Kendra works in a fine dining establishment. Do you know what fine dining means? Instead of saying, I like going to nice restaurants or expensive restaurants, you can say, I like fine dining. These types of restaurants are also called high-end restaurants or fancy restaurants. Kendra came to Los Angeles to pursue a singing career. She's a very good singer. She sings R&B and jazz, and she sings in three different languages, in Portuguese, in Spanish, and English. But she was born in the United States. She's from New Jersey. She also studied science at Rutgers University. She's a really interesting and intelligent person. And make sure you watch this video until the end. You will hear Kendra singing a song that she recently recorded. And now let's listen to the first part of my conversation with Kendra. And then I will come back and I will teach you some expressions that she used. You are a server in a restaurant? Yes, I am a server um, in a fine dining establishment in Topanga Canyon. Uh, what does fine dining mean to you? Fine dining to me means um, quality and effort put forth towards your dishes, uh, knowledge about um, pairings, wine, uh, and caring about the people coming in to experience something unique. How is fine dining different in New York versus Los Angeles? Very interesting question. Um, the fine dining establishments I experienced in New York, uh, they were a lot older. Like the, the establishments have existed a lot longer than the ones that I've run into here. Some of the French restaurants in, in Tribeca that I've worked at um, had like 90 plus years history. Stuff oh, wow. like that. They're a lot more flashy here. Um, oh, in yeah? New York people don't flaunt their money as much. Uh, if, you see, if you see like a, a really old fine dining establishment, it'll be concealed in a very unassuming building. But here you'll see Nobu Malibu like presented on the side of PCH. So you think the people are more flashy in LA also in general? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it definitely comes with having, you know, this fame topic uh, on everyone's mind. If you're dining in New York, it could be winter, it could be cold, you could be trying to hide yourself or like not wanting to see too many people because there are more people out on the streets. Um, but in, uh, in LA, you have to drive to your location. When you get there, you want everyone to know that you've arrived. Kendra used the word pairings. Let's listen to how she used it. Fine dining to me means um, quality and effort put forth towards your dishes, uh, knowledge about um, pairings, wine. Knowing about wine pairings means matching a wine to the kind of meal that you're having. Knowing the appropriate wine to serve with a particular dish. You can say, they pair well together. Or you can say, I don't like how this dish paired with my wine. The combination of flavors isn't right. Let's listen to how Kendra used 90 plus years. Some of the French restaurants in, in Tribeca that I've worked at um, had like 90 plus years history. She said that some restaurants in Tribeca, which is a neighborhood in New York, have a 90 plus years history. And when you say a number and you add the word plus, it means more than that number. You can say, how long have you worked there? 10 plus years. More than 10 years. Let's listen to the way Kendra used the word flashy. They're a lot more flashy here. She said, they're a lot more flashy here. She said, people in Los Angeles are a lot more flashy. And you know the meaning of flash, right? It's a bright light. So something that's flashy is very bright, it's very noticeable, and it's designed to be impressive. You can say, he bought a flashy new sports car. She likes to wear flashy jewelry. Do you know the meaning of the word flaunt? Let's listen to how Kendra used it. Oh, yeah? In New York people don't flaunt their money as much. Oh, yeah? In New York people don't flaunt their money as much. She said, in New York, people don't flaunt their money as much. To flaunt something is to show it. For example, to show your money 
or to show your success or your beauty so that other people notice it. You can say, nobody knows that he's rich because he doesn't like to flaunt his wealth. He doesn't need to impress people. Let's listen to the way Kendra used the next two adjectives, concealed and unassuming. Do you know what they mean? Let's listen to her. If you see like a, a really old fine dining establishment, it'll be concealed in a very unassuming building. In New York, if you see a really old fine dining establishment, very often it will be concealed in an unassuming building. To conceal something is to not show it, to hide something carefully. So if something is concealed, it's hidden from view. Let's use it as a verb. He concealed his gun inside his jacket. It was impossible for me to conceal my excitement. Kendra said that in New York, sometimes very nice restaurants are concealed in an unassuming building. And unassuming is the opposite of flashy. It's modest. Or a person who is unassuming doesn't try to appear important. They're humble, they're quiet or polite. They're not arrogant. You can say, she's such a polite and unassuming person. Despite his great power and wealth, he had a very unassuming personality. Let's listen to the way Kendra used the word fame. It definitely comes with having, you know, this fame topic uh, on everyone's mind. She said in Los Angeles, the fame topic is on everybody's mind. And you know the word famous, right? That's an adjective. And the noun form of famous is fame. So you can say, the talented musician is not really interested in fame. Or you can say, the actor achieved worldwide fame after that film was released. Kendra works as a server in a fine dining restaurant. In the next clip, I asked Kendra, what is the difference between the words waiter and waitress versus the word server? Let's listen to her answer. The word server to me is kind of a newer word. Tell me how you feel about the word server as opposed to I'm a waitress, which I don't think you would call yourself that. Of course, um, that's a good question. And one I've thought about a lot. I, I mean, dining establishments exist all over the United States, all over the world. Um, and I think it's just professionals within those communities trying to separate themselves based on the kind of work that they're doing. So a fine dining server who is um, putting a lot of study time or effort into learning their dishes, learning a changing menu or learning drinks, um, wouldn't want to be compared to a wait waiter or waitress which might work in a diner. And for people who don't know what diner is, what, how oh. would you describe diner? A diner, actually, we're famous for that from my hometown in New Jersey. Oh yeah? Yeah, um, but uh, a diner is a 24-hour establishment that um, serves food all night. You can go after a night out with your friends or in the morning with your family. And um, they're very popular in like uh, the 50s or 60s, I think. I'd like to read to you some online comments that I read about this topic. The difference between waiter and waitress and server. One person said, server is gender neutral and sounds a little more professional in my opinion. Another person said, I typically think of myself as a server, but if someone asks me what I do, I usually say waitress to avoid confusion. The word diner has two different meanings. Let's listen to the way Kendra used it. But uh, a diner is a 24-hour establishment that um, serves food all night. One meaning of diner is a casual restaurant, particularly popular in the 1950s. But we still have a lot of diners all over the United States. But a diner is also a person who dines. And what does it mean to dine? It means to eat dinner. So a person eating dinner, especially in a restaurant, is called a diner. And you can also use it like this. I like to dine out. And that means, I like to eat dinner in restaurants. And be careful about the words diner and dinner. Dinner has a double N, it's pronounced differently. Dinner is the meal that you eat. The diner liked his dinner. Have you heard of this idea, the customer is always right? That's a saying or a slogan that means the customer needs to be happy. The customer needs to feel special. Even if the customer is not right, a business will try to keep a customer happy. I asked Kendra about this concept as it relates to restaurants. Let's listen to her answer. In the United States, we have this saying, the customer is always right. Hmm. And that's especially true, I think, in restaurants. Yes. But, but how do you deal with that? If I were a diner in your restaurant 
and I wasn't happy with the food, I wasn't happy with the dish, what would you do? How, how do you handle that? It's an unspoken rule that all servers and uh, waiters and staff, they hope that our guests understand a lot of things are out of our control and you know, um, we, it really is disheartening when you get someone who doesn't understand that at all. Mm -hmm. But we do abide by the, the customer is always right when it's appropriate. Um, if it's outlandish and you know, if there's some kind of uh, inappropriate or outlandish behavior, then that's obvious and can be reasoned with. But if it's simply, I didn't like the food that I picked, that's no problem and there's always a way to make sure that the, the guest enjoys wh what they're eating. Let's listen to the way Kendra used the word disheartening. It really is disheartening when you get someone who doesn't understand that at all. Mm -hmm. But we do abide by the, the customer is always right. Let's make sure we can pronounce it correctly first. Disheartening. Disheartening. She said, it's really disheartening when you get someone that doesn't understand that. If something is disheartening, it makes you lose hope. It makes you lose courage. It makes you disappointed and less hopeful. And if you're talking about a person, you can say disheartened. When I failed the test for the third time, I was disheartened. It was so disheartening. Let's listen to the way Kendra used to abide by. Mm -hmm. But we do abide by the, the customer is always right. She said, we do abide by, the customer is always right. And to abide by means to obey a rule. To accept a rule or a decision, even if you're not happy with it, even if you don't agree with it, you need to still abide by it. The boy promised that he would abide by the school rules. My lawyer warned me that I needed to abide by the terms of the contract. The next word is outlandish. Do you know what that means? Let's listen to the way Kendra used it. If it's outlandish and, you know, if there's some kind of uh, inappropriate or outlandish behavior. The word outlandish is word number 72 in my course, 400 Advanced English Words You Must Know for Fluent English. Let's listen to the video from my course where I'm teaching the meaning of the word outlandish. The next word is outlandish. Outlandish. And if something is outlandish, it looks or it sounds strange. It's unusual. Her outlandish appearance did not fit into the professional environment of the law office. Let's pronounce law office correctly. Both of those vowel sounds are big. Law office. Open your mouth. Law office. Her outlandish appearance did not fit into the professional environment of the law office. You will notice that I pause to give you a chance to repeat the sentence after me so that you can practice your pronunciation at the same time. I teach a lot of pronunciation rules in that course. The course consists of seven hours of video. In addition, there are audio files that you can download so you can listen to the seven hours just in audio format. You can practice while you're doing something else. You don't only have to watch the videos. And there are quizzes to test your knowledge and to test your progress. To get the course, go to my website, accurateenglish.com. Okay, let's go to the next expression that Kendra used. Let's listen to how she used to reason with then that's obvious and can be reasoned with. She said, it can be reasoned with, and that means it can be discussed. We can discuss it to reach an agreement. We can reason with each other. It can be reasoned with. You can also use it this way. Let's try to reason together. Or when he gets angry, he's very difficult to reason with. It's very difficult to talk to him. He doesn't want to discuss the problem. He's very difficult to reason with. The word dish has two different meanings. Let's listen to the way Kendra and I used it. So do you ask them if they'd like a different dish or? Yes, well, um, we'll discuss what's wrong with their dish, um, what they didn't find appetizing about it. A dish is food prepared in a particular way and served as a part of a meal. So you can say, this restaurant has a lot of delicious seafood dishes. When I visit my grandmother, she always cooks my favorite dish. And I think you know the other meaning of the word dish. It's a plate. It's a container where you put your food. In the next clip that you will watch, Kendra talks about the custom of tipping in an American restaurant. Usually it's 20%. 
but a lot of tourists don't know that. So when they visit the restaurant, sometimes she doesn't get a tip. Let's listen to her talk about it and then I'll come back and I'll teach you a few more expressions. Tell me about the tipping process in the United States. Tipping in the United States, um, we expect about 20% for a, an appropriate tip, but it's very common not to get that, um, especially from foreigners, but not just from foreigners. So um, it's something that we run into often, but we, we don't normally say anything to guests if they tip below. And so it's usually just um, us walking home with less money. So tipping is a very important part of the server's salary. Absolutely. Um, there was a big difference in New York versus Los Angeles that I was not made aware of before coming here. In New York, you get paid $2.14 an hour as a server, no matter where you work. And then your tip you know, uh, supplements that income. But in California, you get $15 an hour plus that income, that same income. So it was a remarkable difference moving here to do the, like, and finding the same position. That is really interesting. I did not know that. Yes, I, I don't know if, if a lot of people back home know it either. Wow. It's a crazy secret. That's the minimum wage, right? Yes, um, uh, here. But in, uh, in New York, it's like a lower wage considering their tip. Right. But in New York, they also get a lot more, tour like a lot of tourism. So they're, you know, getting paid less, but then also getting tipped less um, by these uh, tourists coming in. Kendra said, remarkable difference. So it was a remarkable difference moving here to do the, like, and finding the same position. Instead of saying big or noticeable, you can say remarkable. There was a remarkable difference. Instead of saying, you've made a lot of progress in your English, you can say, you've made remarkable progress in your English. It's remarkable. Let's learn the difference between home and back home. Kendra used the expression back home. I, I don't know if, if a lot of people back home know it either. <laughs> she said, I don't know if a lot of people back home know it either. What does back home mean? It means the place where I am from, where I was born or where I grew up. And she comes from New Jersey. So for her, back home is New Jersey. So if we say I'm going home, that means I'm going to my house. But if you say I'm going back home, it means I'm going to my original home, the place where maybe my grandparents still live, the place where I was born, the place where I grew up. I'm going back home for Christmas. And let's listen to the final clip. Kendra talks about the challenging parts of her job. And she also talks about her personal goals and why she came to Los Angeles. What's the most challenging part about your job? The most challenging part about my job would have to be having to um, maintain all the personal goals and projects I have while making sure that I'm giving my A game at the restaurant. Yeah. It's a constant push and pull between your own perseverance and, and how much you want to do what you're doing. Right. You've been in LA for how many months? Uh, for a year, for 12 months. I got here last December. And what brought you here? Um, I came here for uh, music, for creative competition. I'm a um, jazz and R&B singer. When I was in New York performing and competing, I found that the competition was subpar for me. Um, there were a lot of people trying to explain or tell people that they were different and special without showing it. And I feel like in Los Angeles, a lot of people show it more. Um, so everyone here is offering so much, they make you wonder, what do I offer? And that's what I came here to figure out. How do people get in touch with you? Oh, well, um, you can find me on Instagram as Dare to Destroy, uh, the number two. And um, my name is Rena. It's short for Renaissance Woman. Renaissance Woman. I think you are a true Renaissance Woman. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Let's listen to how she used the expression A game. While making sure that I'm giving my A game at the restaurant. She said, making sure I'm giving my A game at the restaurant. And you can say to give your A game or to bring your A game. And that means to give your best effort, to perform at the highest level, your best ability to give your A game. You can say, there's so much competition here. I'd better bring my A game. Let's listen to how she used push and pull. The constant push and pull between your own perseverance and, and how much you want to do what you're doing. She said, it's a constant push and pull. It's a constant struggle to find the right balance. It's push and pull. I asked Kendra, what brought you here? And that means, why did you come here? Why did you move to this place? What brought you to Los Angeles? My job brought me here. 
Kendra sings jazz and R&B. Do you know what R&B means? Rhythm and blues. We don't pronounce the and, we just say un. Rhythm and blues. R&B. Let's listen to how Kendra used the word subpar. When I was in New York performing and competing, I found that the competition was subpar for me. If something is subpar, it's not high quality. It's below average. It's not as good as expected. You can say, this restaurant looks elegant, but the food is subpar. Or, that team had a subpar performance this season. And now, let's listen to a short sample of a song that Kendra is singing. She also wrote the song. My love oceans for my toes. I'm not from here or from anywhere. Oh, just leave me alone. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, make sure you do so and click on the notification bell so that you can find out when I release my next videos. Thanks for watching and keep practicing your English. To get the two courses, the American Accent Course and the 400 Advanced Words You Must Know for Fluent English, go to AccurateEnglish.com.